So again, welcome to everyone. For those who were not here a couple of minutes ago, um, this is a scheduled webinar. So you will not be allowed to speak. You can type your questions into the chat function. You can use the chat function if you have comments or remarks. You can also use the question and answer section. And if you're facing issues um, regarding sound or video or connection or connectivity at all, don't worry, you will get a video of the a recorded video of the webinar afterwards automatically by mail. Um, it's 10 o'clock now, so um, I think we can start. Meanwhile, there's quite a couple of people here. So thank you for your time. Thank you for participating. Good morning, everybody. Um, today's topic of the webinar will be the latometer, um, which is more or less one of the basic instruments of thermal analyzers. And I will do a talk to a presentation for you, which will last around about 30 minutes from now. And I think um, yeah, we are quite complete, so I can start. So nice to meet you. I will start the webinar now. Um, before we begin, I want to introduce myself. My name is Sebastian Seibt. I'm the head of laboratory here at Linzeis headquarters in Germany. I'm a chemist, and I'm working for Linzeis since 2013. I'm mainly responsible for the DC, TGA, and the latometer series instruments. So basically responsible for the uh, classical thermal analysis, if you want to call it like that. Um, besides that, I have colleagues who's, uh, or who are responsible for thermal electrics and um, yeah, thermal connectivity, which is a topic a little bit aside of the classic thermal analysis. Um, for those who do not know the company yet, um, Linzeis is a German manufacturer of thermal analysis instruments. We were founded in 1956 by Dr. Maximilian Linzeis in Selb, which is right in the middle of Germany and close to the Czech uh, Republic border. Since then, we have our main manufacturing here in Germany, and we have yeah, facilities in the US and China as well, where we do repair, where we have testing labs as well, where we can do trainings. Um, from where we service our instruments all over the world. And in all the other countries, we have distributors who represent us. So in most countries, you can get access to a Linzeis distributor or a Linzeis responsible person. We still are family owned. So nowadays, our owner is Mr. Klaus Linzeis, the guy on the picture in the middle here. He's the son of our founder. So Klaus Linzeis, the second generation, is the owner of the company. And his two sons, Mr. Florian Linzeis and Dr. Vincent Linzeis, are the CEOs of our company and doing the daily business nowadays. That's how this company is structured. We are around 100 employees. Meanwhile, as I said, spread a little bit between US, Germany, and China. Um, our business area or our main business area is the manufacturing of measurement instruments for thermal analysis. That is, as I mentioned, classical thermal analysis like a TGA, DSC, the latter meters, um, thermal mechanical analysis. And of course, we also do a lot of thermal conductivity and thermoelectric instruments for analysis of effects like thermal conductivity, Hall effect, Seebeck coefficient, stuff like that. We try to cover the complete range. And we also offer measurements in our own service labs at these three locations you can see on the map here. So that's what we basically do. As I mentioned, this is the product range that goes from, as I said, DSC, thermogravimetry, um, simultaneous thermal analysis, dilatometry, thermal mechanical analysis over thermal conductivity instruments, yeah, thermal electric testers, thin film analyzers, Hall effect measurement machines. And what we also do is a lot of customization of all these products. So we do adjustment regarding pressure range, regarding temperature range. We do um, yeah, customization regarding special applications like magnifying the yeah, maximum sample holders, um, adjusted to the customer needs if there's a special application like nuclear applications where the instrument has to be placed in a hood or stuff like that. That's what we also do. But back to the today's topic. Um, today's topic is about the dilatometers. So that's what we focus in this today's presentation. Um, therefore, I want to yeah, introduce to you, for those who do not already know, the basic uh, principle or the basic principle of a dilatometer. What you can see on the stream here is yeah, a drawing how a classical push rod dilatometer works in general. So what you see, um, you have 
a kind of measurement system. It's like a measuring system that's in a, in a, yeah, in a box here that somehow detects movement. Connected to the measurement system, there's this yellow part, which is the so-called push rod. So this is a flexible, movable part that's going from the measurement device into a cooled flange into a heated furnace. So this push rod goes from the device that detects the, the, yeah, the length change into the hot area where the sample that you want to measure is basically placed. The sample is the red part. So this is the whatever you want to measure. And this red part is, of course, placed in a furnace. The screen yeah, surrounding here symbolizes some insulation material. And this little coil you can see here around the sample chamber, this is a heater. So you can control the atmosphere. You can control the temperature of the sample quite well. And as the temperature changes, the sample usually reacts by expansion. And this expansion or shrinkage is what you can detect by the movement of this push rod. So that's what a dilatometer basically does. It measures the change of length of the sample when the temperature of the sample changes. There, of course, are different yeah, principles how you can detect the movement of the push rod and how you yeah, have to correct the complete measurement result. Our dilatometer range goes from yeah, almost zero Kelvin, so liquid helium temperatures, up to 2,800 centigrade. That means we can cover the complete range of accessible feasible temperatures, either by cooling with liquid helium dehydrogen or by heating with graphite furnaces up to at least 2,800 centigrade as a maximum. We have classical instruments like on the scheme you just saw. We have push rod dilatometers in horizontal and vertical setup. They are called the dilatometer L75 and L76 series, which is, I would say, our basic instrument. These basic instruments are classical push rod dilatometers that can be equipped with one up to four push rods. So you can measure up to four samples simultaneously, which is then this so called quattro dilatometer you can see on the right side. And the standard ones are, can be equipped with one or two push rods. Um, sorry for the confusion. If there are four, then it's a quattro dilatometer, which is the vertical dilatometer with four push rods. Sorry. Um, besides that, we have optical dilatometers. And these optical dilatometers, I will show you later, they are a little bit special because they do not have a pusher, they just have a sample holder and they detect the length changed by a camera and special optics. Besides that, we also have um, deformation and so-called quenching dilatometers that heat with an inductive coil. So you have an inductive field for ultra fast heating of magnetic samples, mainly iron and steel samples. And then you can rapidly quench them by adding yeah, cooled helium to the sample. So you can reach heating and cooling rates of several hundred degrees per second to simulate forging process in a steel manufacturing process, which is a very unique and very special tool. And besides that, we have this customized machines that I already mentioned. Also, we have high pressure dilatometers that can, that can operate in pressurized atmospheres. We have dilatometers with a laser optic or with a cryo yeah, option where you can go down to the helium temperatures around two or three Kelvin. So that's, that's the product range we have regarding the dilatometers. In the following slides, I will yeah, go a little bit into detail regarding the options we have and regarding the detectors we have. So the classical push rod dilatometers, L75, L76 series, I just mentioned, as said, can be equipped with one or two samples in case of the horizontal one, up to four samples in the case of the vertical one. They both come up with an automatic contact pressure adjustment. So the force between push rod and sample can be controlled, can be yeah, kept constant during the whole measurement. And this is more or less the basic configuration. Um, the difference between horizontal and vertical, that's what some people might ask. And what's quite important to know is that a horizontal system is a yeah, easy to handle design. It's quite robust and it's yeah, in the moderate price range. So it's the dilatometer setup that you usually prefer. The advantage is the easy sample handling, but it comes with the drawback that for some samples, especially if the samples start to react or to sinter or bake, um, decompose or something, they can somehow react uh, or get stuck to the sample holder and it's difficult to remove them without breaking the sample holder. That's one of the reasons why we started to manufacture vertical setups, because in a vertical setup, the sample more or less stands on top of the push rod and is only in touch with the end plate, not with the tube surrounding the sample. So you have less contact 
between sample holder and sample in the vertical setup, and use the less traffic, you have lower friction between sample and sample holder, and you also have a lower risk that the sample reacts with the sample holder. Besides that, we found that due to convection effects, if you go to very low temperatures or to very high temperatures, a vertical setup has a better temperature spread within the reaction chamber. So if, you, if it comes to cooling with liquid nitrogen or liquid helium, the low temperatures and the low gas within, within the instrument tends to go down. And therefore, if you have the furnace on the top side cooler, you have a lot of convection, a lot of movement in the atmosphere inside, which is bad for your temperature spread on the sample. So therefore, in a vertical setup, you prefer, if it's a cooled instrument, furnace down, detector upside, if it's a high temperature instrument like with a graphite furnace up to 2000 or even higher temperature and uh, centigrade temperature, um, then you have the furnace on the top side, the detector downside, and then you have also lower convection inside of the instrument. So you get a little bit higher temperature accuracy. That's why we prefer a vertical setup for the very low and very high temperatures. Um, another advantage is that the vertical setup has a little bit smaller footprint in the lab which is also sometimes an advantage if it comes to the lab space requirements. Regarding the detectors, as said at the very beginning, you have a detector that usually monitors the movement of the sample, the movement of the push rod. That can be achieved using two ways. The classical way our push rod dilatometers are yeah, designed for or were basically um, built since the very beginning is the use of a LVDT. So it's a linear variable differential transformer, shortly LVDT, which is which basically means you have an electric magnet. And you have not just a simple magnet. You have a setup of three coils. You have a primary coil, the orange part surrounding a secondary one and secondary two coil. And within this coil setup, you have an iron or magnetic core. This core is connected to the push rod. And once the pushrod moves in the one or the other direction due to sample expansion or to sample shrinkage, this core within the magnet coils will move. And by the direction of the movement, you can detect the, yeah, more or less if the voltage you get is positive or negative. And the amount of voltage out of your magnet reading gives you the amount of movement. This can be adjusted very, very fine. So basically, you can get um, very tiny movements. So you can record movements in the nanometer range, even if that's close to atom scale and doesn't make sense at all, you can have a resolution down to 20, 10 nanometers which, with ease. So that's way beyond the optical wavelength. So if you, maybe somebody of you know that, if you just want to measure with a, like a microscope or with a camera, the detection limit will be the optical wavelength. Whatever is shorter than the optical wavelength, so in the nanometer range, of several hundred nanometers can't be detected by optics. So therefore, this solution using a magnet is quite good. And it is, yeah, it was invented in the 1950s. And since then, the technique has not that much changed. So the LVDT is the yeah, state-of-the-art technique of length detect change detection. Besides that, there are some techniques where you use so-called optical encoders. As I just mentioned, just looking with optics on a, on a sample or on an object and then try to, ch uh, to see the length change by optics alone oh. won't work because of the optical wavelength. Um, to overcome this limit, you can add this actuator plate to your push rod, this black part. This is a black actuator that has white and black stripes. These white stripes are semi-transparent, the black stripes are not transparent. And then you have a light source, a polarized fil air filter, and a face plate on the one side. And this face plate gives you phased light beams. They interact with this actuator. And if this actuator moves, the phase of the light beams will change. Even a small change that's yeah, smaller than the optical wavelength can be detected here. You have a detector that detects the light phase. And the movement of the actuator will interrupt it. And by the direction of the disturbance and the amount of the disturbance, you can also monitor the length change quite accurate in the same range like a LVDT could do. Between LVDT and optical encoder, there's a little difference um, regarding yeah, robustness, regarding range, and regarding where it's useful or not. So what I have to state is 
that um, the slide is missing. I'm sorry. With the LVDT setup, you can measure, of course, a range that's limited by the range of the magnetic coil. So if the core moves out of the coil, this is the detection limit of your system. Using an optical encoder, you can use, in theory, an endless actuator plate. So the limit of, of measurement range is limited by the length of this actuator plate that can be elonged in a way that you need. So you have a little bit higher range if you use an actuator because you can adjust it more easy than if you have a magnet core. However, the drawback of the actuator plate is if there is some dust and dirt particles that may cover the actuator plate, this actuator won't, won't work anymore because the light is then scattered and then the detector doesn't see a good signal anymore. So it's a little bit more sensitive to dust, dirt, and it needs more and requires much more maintenance than an electric magnet does. Therefore, we prefer the LVDT setup instead of the optical encoder. However, we can offer both depending on what's the application, what's the setup. But these two things is what you get no matter where you buy your dilatometer, this is what's, what's state of the art nowadays. That's what you need to know. So either a classical dilatometer with a push rod either has an actuator, an optical encoder, or it has an LVDT setup. That's basically the two techniques you can select. Regarding the sample holders, we are also quite flexible. So the push rod itself, of course, is yeah, housed by a sample holder, and the sample holder can be made out of quartz, made out of alumina, made out of graphite, depending on the temperature range. And of course, the diameter and size can change and vary. Um, depending on what you want to measure, we can adjust our sample holders for bigger samples, smaller samples, bigger diame diameter, lower di diameter. It depends a little bit on what you want to do. We also have setups with yeah, more or less contact free, also for the horizontal, but to be honest, um, if you want to have a contact free or as lot as uh, much contact free as possible, you usually require or recommend a vertical setup. Besides that, we have adapters like these hollow cylinders you can see here for powders and paste to measure the expansion of a powder, a paste, and even a liquid. Um, in some cases, that's not possible if the particle size gets too small. But for common powders or granules, we can also use this powder adapters and paste adapters to measure expansion of powders and paste. So that's the measurement setup that we have. And what I already mentioned as well is that we have a quite high range of yeah, temperature that we can cover. We have a thermal um, setup of furnaces that covers from basically liquid nitrogen up to 2,800 centigrade graphite furnace. So that's the furnaces you can select. Besides that, we also have a cryodilatometer with a liquid helium cryostat that goes down to 3 Kelvin. That's not listed here because it's not just a furnace, it's a complete instrument. And regarding the other instruments, the dilatometers with flexible furnace, that's the furnace range you can have. Depending on the temperature range, some yeah, requirements regarding the thermocouples that measures your temperature are also coming with the range. And that means you can operate in almost any kind of atmosphere up to 1600, 650 centigrade. If you want to go higher than that, the atmosphere you can use is limited to nitrogen or even vacuum because then it gets very complicated. Um, in that case, your pyrometer or type C limited regarding temperature sensors. So the temperature accuracy is a little bit lower in the high temperature range and your atmosphere is yeah, reduced to nitrogen or vacuum. No reactive atmosphere possible anymore. But if you operate in a range between liquid nitrogen up to 650, you can almost, almost use every kind of atmosphere, reactive atmosphere, reducing, oxidizing, uh, whatever you prefer. There we are quite flexible. Then I have a few slides about these special instruments that I already mentioned. So we have an optical dilatometer or heating microscope. This is one of our special dilatometers. Here, you do not have a push rod in touch with the sample anymore. You do not need an optical encoder. You do not need a LVDT. Here, you really have a camera setup. And here, as I said, you're limited by the optical wavelength. So you can measure around about 0 0.5 to 1 micrometer. However, you can use highly corrosive atmospheres as you have a closed, you have a closed sample chamber with, with nothing more inside than just a sample holder. And then on the end of this furnace, you have optical ports. On the one side, you have a light source. The light enlightens the sample from the back side or from the rear side. And on the other side, you have an optical port where the camera is placed. 
So the rear side light hits the sample and the camera has a polarization filter and the color filter. So the sample, uh, the camera sees the sample as a black body in a white background. And then it can, by automatically adjusting the contrast, it can detect the border and the edge of the sample and monitor the movement of the edge. Usually we place a reference sample next to the unknown sample to get rid of the influence of atmosphere density and uh, yeah, gas flow in there. And by that, um, yeah, we can detect within one run the expansion of the sample like in a classical push or dilatometer, but without touching it. In case of sinter studies, it's very useful to not touch the sample because if you have a sintering uh, sample that shrinks during heating because it's losing some binders and so on, if you touch it with the push rod, you give it one direction. So you comp uh, compress it in one direction, you have two free directions uh, where it can move. In the optical dilatometer, you can you do not touch it, so it can move in every direction as it yeah, needs to move. And it's a more realistic um, impression of the reaction and behavior of the sample if you do that. Besides the dilatometer mode where you really measure the expansion, you can also measure effects like contact angle, melting behavior. So you can have a full image of the sample like you see on the left side. You can measure sphere point, wetting angle, stuff like that by automatically shape detection. That's what the optical dilatometer can also do. And then I want to introduce another very special instrument, which I already mentioned as well, is, which is the quenching and deformation dilatometers. As I said before, we have this special series for the steel industry. Um, what it does is it has no furnace. It has a magnetic field generator. It generates a uh, yeah, field, fluctuating field with a frequency on a copper coil surrounding the sample. So the sample should be um, ferromagnetic. If you have a magnetic sample, uh, it reacts with the inductive field and heats up quite rapidly. So you can reach heating and cooling speeds of around 400 centigrades per second, which is really simulating a process like throwing a cold piece of iron into a hot furnace or something like that. So that means with this inductive dilatometer, you can really simulate forging process. You can simulate steel industry process. And on the one hand, we have this quenching dilatometer as a as it is, so it can heat with an inductive coil and cool with cooled helium gas that's yeah, through this little hose you can see on the top right picture released to the sample directly. Doing so, you can simulate fast cooling, like putting the sample in the water bath or something. And besides that, we have the extent to real deformation dilatometer, which means there is an actor that's added. So this actor added to this, to this instrument means that you can apply forces up to several kilonewtons with this kilonewton force during heating and cooling, you can really simulate a forging process like a hammer or something hitting the sample, yeah, uh, compressing it or releasing the force and during heating and cooling. And therefore you can get phase diagrams of different steel phases. The name of these diagrams is usually uh, TTT, THT and CCT diagrams, so controlled heating, controlled cooling, uh, temperature diagrams that are showing you the faces of steel under different conditions. And these diagrams are quite important to make sure, um, depending on the process, how you manufacture your steel or your metal parts, how stable they are, what's their hardness, and what's their resistivity against several mechanical influence. And this instrument is, uh, complies with the ASTM A1033, which is the responsible or the mainly important ASTM regarding steel faces and steel industries. So it's a very yeah, unique instrument in a very uh, yeah, small niche market, but it's quite important there. And yeah, we are one of two manufacturers in the world who can do that. And besides that, um, I want to introduce also the cryodilatometer I mentioned a couple of times before. So we have a helium liquid helium cryostat dilatometer that really can go down to um, minus, and two, minus and 269 centigrade. So it's around three to four Kelvin and up to 200 centigrades. Um, that's a quite broad range and a quite a unique technique as well. So we can achieve heating and cooling rates up to five Kelvin per minute. If you want to go below liquid nitrogen, we have cooling rates up to one, maybe 0 0.5 Kelvin per minute. The purpose of this setup was um, initially we were asked by uh, the space 
company, it was NASA. And we also have, meanwhile, we have sold some to the ESA, the European Space Agency, uh, because they do a lot of satellite research. And out in space, you have temperatures close to zero Kelvin, so around five, six Kelvin. And depends how close you get to the, to the Earth or Sun, of course. But in free space, you have around five or four Kelvin. And if you want to make sure that your satellite and your rocket parts behave in the way you expect, um, people really try to test it under the conditions that you have there. So you want to know the expansion, you want to know the material behavior at these temperatures, and therefore the dilatometer that goes down there was a need, and that's where we developed it. Meanwhile, as I said, we have sold some more to other satellite companies and space agencies. Um, however, there's a second market popping up, which is the quantum computing. So Microsoft bought one to see the behavior, the material behavior of microchips in the range of close to zero Kelvin, up to five or 10 Kelvin. And meanwhile, we have a second one for uh, yeah, computer industries out there. They are also doing research regarding quantum computing, um, which is also a yeah, quite interesting market. Um, we also have one out there for fundamental physics and R&D where it comes to superconductivity and stuff like that. So that's the market for this special kind of dilatometer. And there, we are really the only one who offer a dilatometer in that range. So that's the, one of the other special instruments. The last slides I have are some slides showing some typical applications. So just that you get an impression what a dilatometer finally does or what you can do with it. Um, as I mentioned, the typical application, of course, is the thermal length change, the coefficient of thermal expansion determination. So materials usually have a constant expansion by temperature that can be uh, calculated by using or by use of the material constant, the so-called coefficient of thermal expansion, which is usually a factor that you have to multiply with L0 and the temperature, and then you get the expansion at any given temperature. Once you know that, and that's what the dilatometer determines, so once you know that, you know how your material usually behaves. It can measure the expansion of the volume, sintering behavior, detect softening and glass transitions, of course, and also detect phase transitions that go uh, hand in hand with the material of the structural change of the material. Um, so typical measurements look like this. Usually you measure versus temperature. So what you see is on the y-axis, you see the delta L. One, the blue curve down here is the absolute change in micrometers or microns. The red curve is the change in percentage. The x-axis is the temperature. So if you heat a sample, in that case, it was a glass sample. So if you heat your glass over temperature, it expands. And at a certain point, you see a change of expansion that suddenly increases the expansion rate, and then it starts to decrease. That's the softening point, the typical softening point of a glass sample where it starts to flow. This is how it looks like. Um, this is just one application, the more typical application. But you can do a little bit more with the dilatometer. You can use it to calculate a DTA as well. So this is a function that some people ask for um, by checking the given temperature or the, the set temperature of a sample and the actual reach temperature of the sample. You can uh, compare them. And by calculation with a certain model, you can calculate a DTA effect. So that means you can see if there's an endothermic or exothermic effect occurring when a phase change occurs. That's what's shown in this picture here. Yeah, the other application, of course, is sintering. So this is how a typical sinter measurement looks like. You have an expansion measurement. In that case, it was no expansion. It was a little bit shrinkage due to loss of humidity. You see in the blue curve at the, at the, down here at the bottom side. And at a certain temperature, the sample starts to sinter. It starts to get shorter, obviously. It loses water, it loses binders, it starts to react, and it burns. And finally, you get a massive material with a yeah, definitely shorter um, length. And during cooling, you have the normal shrinkage you have during cooling. On the left side, you see pictures. So this was a kind of brick material before and after sinter measurement. So after the measurement, it gets hard and brittle. Before the measurement, it was like like uh, yeah soft or like sand, like compressed sand. Afterwards, you have a solid body. That's a typical sinter study. We call that green body in the in the unburned state. And after the firing, you get rid of binders, you get rid of humidity, you have a solid material. That's what's done with porcelain, with glasses, with 
ceramics at all, and also brick materials. That's that's the typical burning behavior. And by studying this, by optimizing the heating and cooling rates, by optimizing uh, yeah, dwell and holding times and temperatures, you can get a set a cinder process that lead, needs as yeah low temperature as possible, and to save energy, to save material, of course, and to get rid of yeah, cracks and so on. You, this is usually optimized using dilatometers. There's also special synthetic experiments, like in this case, uh, if you if it comes to um, metal powders or powder metal sintering, uh, usually or very often there are special atmospheres required. In that case, it was a hydrogen atmosphere. So we did hydrogen sintering in pure hydrogen atmosphere, where powder samples or metal sinter green bodies were used. Of course, they behave similar to the ceramics, um, but usually you use hydrogen or you use reducing atmospheres to avoid that these metals um, start to oxidize. So you do not want to have the metals oxidize and then form metal oxides. You want them to form an alloy or form a solid body, and therefore you use reducing atmosphere to get rid of the free oxygen within the instrument. So that's the sintering in hydrogen atmosphere. Then we have, as I mentioned, powder adapters. This measurement here is uh, yeah, the melting or compression of a powder. So you have constant force applied to a powder container. During heating, the powder gets softer, gets compressed a little bit more. So you see an ongoing shrinkage. And at a certain point, the shrinkage suddenly gets massive. That's the point of reaction where the powder starts to yeah, more or less melt. So this is how a powder measurement may look like, just that you have seen that as well. And finally, I have one measurement of the 2800 centigrade dilatometer and one of the uh, cryo cryodilatometer. This is the one going up to 2800 centigrade, just to show that this is possible. That was a graphite sample showing you the expansion rate of the graphite. So you see, you have more or less a constant expansion. It's a more or less stable material with a coefficient of thermal expansion that's more or less stable. By the way, what you see here is more or less typical. At the very beginning, you have non-homogeneous heating of the sample until you reach a homogeneous heating of the sample and constant heating rate. So in the very beginning, the CTE, the coefficient of thermal expansion is a little bit fluctuating until you reach a constant linear heating. And there, the CTE is more or less a stable value. And you see, we really can go up to 2,700, 2,800 centigrades in the very end. And on the other hand, um, this is a curve from the liquid helium cryostat. This shows you that we reach the minus 250 centigrades um, using the helium cryostat. That was a measurement of a copper sample, as far as I know, um, that was cooled down to minus 250 in this kind of experiment. And you see temperature went down and up quite linear. And the sample also responds by a more or less linear length change. So it gets shorter during cooling and it expands during heating. And what you see, there are some fluctuations at the lower range that are not coming from the behavior of the instrument. This is really phase transitions and reactions of the sample in that low temperature range, what the customer in that case wanted to see. Um, finally, I have also a picture and some screenshots of this uh, retail dilatometers, this induction dilatometers. So this is a heating and cooling curve of a steel sample. During heating and cooling, the iron undergoes a phase transition from matters to arsenate and back. So during heating, you have a phase transition over here. So sorry, over here. And during cooling, there's a reverse phase transition. As you can see, there is a gap in temperature between these two phase transitions. Uh, transitions. Um, this gap in temperature where the back transition takes place depends very much on the heating and cooling speed. If you do this with different heating and cooling speeds, the back transformation will be shifted to lower or higher temperatures. And out of this shift of the transformation, you can determine the phase you get finally after your experiment by heating and by cooling rate. And that's what the steam industry is looking for. If you combine this experiments with different heating and cooling speeds, you get a three-dimensional graphics like you see on the right side. So this is a graphic that's consisting of different heating and cooling speeds, giving you phase transition shifts that are like this purple and dark blue lines here. They indicate the, the 
yeah, temperature and the position of the phase transition, depending on time and temperature. And out of this, you can have a 3D plot where your phase of steel or phase of iron mixture is stable. And then you can define temperature zones and heating and cooling speeds that lead to the yeah, phase you're looking for of the material. Um, this is how the inductive dilatometer usually works. So this was the last example. That's the end of the presentation. Uh, I want to thank you so far for your attention.